What's going on, folks? It's your boy again, Dr. Sean Thomas, back in the building. Be more today's show, episode 87, season three. Welcome back to the show. We're here in Black History Month. And folks, as always, thank you so much for your love and support. The Be More Today show is trending everywhere. We're everywhere, as you guys know. Uh, Be More Today is on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. So please go on there and subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. Right now, we are heard in 53 countries. Uh, we are trending around 15,000 downloads for the shows, and it's been great just seeing the progression of so many people trying to live better lives in terms of their health, their fitness, and their wealth. So thank you so much for being a part of that movement. And we're in Black History Month, a great month for us to recognize the accomplishments of Black and Brown people across the world for so many years. We are amazing, as you already know. So uh, my quote for today is simple, as always. It is a quote that says, Doing the best at this moment puts you in the best place for the next moment, said by legendary woman, Oprah Winfrey. Now, Oprah Winfrey said a number of things in life, but I do think this quote is poignant because doing the best at this moment can make the trajectory of your life even greater. And I brought someone on, this, on the show who I've known for such a long time. He is the embodiment of taking the steps to greatness to be the best version of himself and now he's doing that for other people. And he's a great friend of mine, a fellow Chuck Ray Hall uh, uh, alumni. And we played basketball together. We did dance stuff together. Uh, he's my guy and he is Dr. Bami uh, Alotumbasun. Now, Dr. Bami is a primary care physician in Tampa, Florida. Prior to moving to Florida in 2021, Bami was a medical director at a rural community health center in Grass Valley, California. After spending a year in the frigid cold of Fairbanks, Alaska. In Alaska, he practiced in a family practice, right? And then he was very passionate about working in underserved populations at a community health center. He trained at one of the largest teaching health centers, the Institute of Family Health in Harlem, New York, big ups to Harlem, you already know. With his hospital-based training at Mount Sinai Medical Center, where I was born at, and my daughter was as well. He studied medical uh, medicine at Wake Forest and has an MBA from the University of North Carolina. He spent his undergrad years at the University of Pennsylvania, UPenn, and was in Prep for Prep 9 program in NYC as a youth. Through Prep 9, he went to Chuck Ray Hall, as you already know, forever true to Golden Blue, where he met the one and only, as he says, me, but folks, <laughs> he truly is uh, the doctor of many talents and the superstar on this show today. And he's recently opened up a practice in Tampa, Florida, in order to provide care for patients in a holistic manner that we're going to talk about today. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, pets included, please welcome to the stage, my boy, Biggie Bams, aka Biggie Bams, but really known as Dr. Bami. Dr. Bami, what is going on? Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Sean. It's great to be here talking to you. Last time we talked was at Mount Sinai. You know, I was, uh, I wouldn't say I was at the delivery. I was at the, on there, you know, with you the day of the delivery, right? It, yeah. It was, it was crazy to see that you were there. I think you posted something on Instagram, like I'm at Mount Sinai. So it's a pleasure to see you this many years later, um, doing well. I follow the podcast um, and I'm proud of you. Thank you so much, sir. You know, that day really was incredible. Not just because my, my daughter was born, but seeing you literally in the hospital, literally at our room was just like, what? It just brought me full circle because, you know, so many people are, um, you know, privileged to have the ability to, you know, give birth in the hospital and to have great care. And Mount Sinai was great to us. I was born there. My daughter was born there. But to see you there just brought everything full circle, not just because I was born there, she was born there, but recognizing, you know, my high school uh, path and what Choke meant to me, and then seeing your journey, you know, to be a doctor and in that setting, it just just was the best day. It was the best day in, in, a, in many days that I've had. So I'm super proud of you. I had to have you on the show today. And people don't know, they may not know Biggie Bams, but, um, you know, you and I had a, a number of interactions uh, in high school, um, oh, yeah. sports to dance. I mean, I've got videos of, of you rapping. And doing yeah, all I, think, I think we had some bars, you know, you and Parag. <laughs> <laughs> had some good times. We've had some good times uh, there. Show was, uh, I think I was a formative experience. Um, you know, I still bring it back to that, you know, those years, like, you know, with all the schooling that I've gone to, 
I still see Chode as just like unique and it's uh, in how it shaped, you know, my path and just how I think today. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And we give shout out to uh, Chode Ramey Hall, clearly the, one of the best uh, prep schools, I think, in the Northeast. Um, but I also wanted to, just in the history, on the, the Light of Black History Month in February, you know, we've had a number of, of guests on the show who were part of the prep uh, NIME program, and you are clearly a great product of that. So do you mind just talking to people about what PrEP9 is, was to you, and um, how it kind of skyrocketed you into show and into your other educational yeah. experts? So, so PrEP9, anybody, you know, who's part of the program, it's a fraternity, you know, it's a brotherhood, sisterhood of just people from inner city New York and some of Jersey, North Jersey, um, who went through the rigorous process of, of getting in, uh, getting the program, you know, there were 60 of us at the time, this is like mid 90s, um, who we were, <laughs> the, what I remember most about those days is, is I, I lived deep in Queens, I was in Jamaica, Queens at the time, and our school was in Trinity, which is basically uh, Upper West Side. Um, and so that's a, that's a nice commute. And I just remember day one, reading Charles Dickens' Great Expectations on the, on the subway home, like, how am I going to do this program? But um, through that program, you know, the, I mean, at that age, I, you know, it challenged us so much and it exposed us because that first summer we actually were at Cho and I never heard, you know, you hear a boarding school, you're like, oh, well, that's uh, where the bad kids go. Um, we, we spent that summer at Cho Roots Rees, you know, like we were out there and, um, you know, I think it, it, it changed a lot of people and it took a lot of people because we wouldn't have, there were great schools in New York City. I, I would never, you know, I could have had a great experience in New York City, Stuyvesant, Bronx Science, but I think exposing inner city, black, brown youth to that is, um, is just some, coming from public school too. So not like the, you know, not like the, 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 your dad made it. So you, you got exposed to it. It's, this is like, my parents are immigrants from Nigeria. They would have never known. All they knew was Harvard, Yale, Princeton, you know, that's, that's the three schools they knew. So to go through that program and then to, they stay with you over through the years. So Cho, Penn, you know, through the years, they, they come to the campus and they get everyone together. So to see everyone else kind of go and, and become what they became and be leaders in, on your campus. And, you know, I think it, it's a brand, you know, and, and in that brand, you kind of, you know, it's like being a minority, it's, it's its own little pocket. And then being in prep was its own little, you know, smaller pocket. And um, so to, to, to this day, you know, I, I still talk to my prep people, you know, I think I probably talked to Jamel two weeks ago, you know, Jamel Melville, um, you know, I, I still connect. So I, I, I will always have love for the program and moving, actually going back into New York for a residency at, at, in Harlem, I um, was able to participate um, and do like a video with, the, so re-engage re with some prep people. Um, Kristen Clark, the DOJ, the, the head of DOJ, she's prep. Uh, we did a video together. Um, so like just being like, wow, like prep people are in, you know, Washington now, you know, prep people are leaders now. Um, it, it's just been a remarkable experience. Yeah. Yeah. I saw the video. I was privileged to see the video. You did a great job. And, um, you know, Jamel and I ran the, the marathon together this past November. So uh, <laughs> it's just, it's just really great to see the connections. I, I wasn't a prep, um, a prep student at all, but I, I appreciated the camaraderie that that prep students had at Cho. Um, I had never heard of the prep program. I was I went a different route to get to Cho. Um, but when I got to Cho and heard about all the people who were in Prep Nine, and there was a, a fraternity sorority feel to that that you guys really connected in a way that that was just it was beautiful. Um, and then opened that up to all the minorities with like. Um, CALSA and other things that we had at show our Afro Latino Student Alliance and you know it just made that fraternity of that brotherhood just even bigger recognizing that we all came from different places and now that we're all here you know let's do this together and I'm sure when you went to Penn and I went to Brown there were other networks of minorities that you went into and had other groups that that did that same thing on a greater scale so you know we, we are people of color have done a great job at continuing to just give spaces where spaces were not provided. And I think that prep is a great uh, starting block for many, many students just to 
live just be exposed to places like Cho Andover and Exeter and wherever else. So kudos to Prep Nye and all the work that you guys have done together to continue to give Black and Brown people a space and a brighter future. And I, I will, I can also add that in, in our years at Cho, uh, I think the school seal prize, which was whatever the highest prize, it went to Mark Callender your year, uh, went to Jamel my year. Uh, I think it went to another prep person within that. And this is for everybody. This is out of all the students in your in your class in your uh, graduating class. Uh, prep prep kids, you know, they represented, you know, at least during our era. Um, so yeah, that's I mean that's what kind of that. Um, we're working hard, like getting just grind. It's kind of like being an athlete, right? If you're if you're training with the uh, with college kids and at freshman year in high school, you're gonna be a better athlete come come college. So right. it's it's uh, that's kind of what I hope that it's what it produced. Like I hope uh, you know, I hope I go to the reunion if they have one this year. They, they've been uh, <laughs> they've had to do a few online ones. I don't know if I can you know if I enjoy the online ones as much. Yeah, no, it's good to see everybody. It's good to see everybody. So, so Doc, I know that you've done a number of different things. You traveled the world. I've been following your story. You were in Alaska for a while. You were, um, you know, all over, just, just continuing to hone your craft and to prepare yourself for this moment where now you have uh, a location that's called Just Medical Care. What is Just Medical Care um, just for the people who are listening on the show? So Just Medical Care, um, I've... I wanted to create something that I came to Florida um, because of, uh, you know, I was in California. I felt like I felt initially I wanted to open it in Oakland, um, if I had to be honest. But Oakland was just, you know, last couple of years, unfortunately, things things kind of changed and, and, you know, it was less predictable. So I was like, you know, what, I'm going to move to Tampa, Florida, um, of all places. I have a, have a good friend out here and just thought it was the time. Um, there's Tampa is very diverse. So I have always wanted to stay in that kind of, you know, coming the culture I grew up in. I want to, I wanted to, you know, I I know a lot of doctors do make it and they, they reach the heights. And I think it's, that's very respectable. And that's the way that, you know, they, they go. Um, I've always worked in community health centers, like I said, the Institute of Family Health in, in Harlem, where it was, you know, that's 121, 19th and Madison, you know, that that's basically East Harlem, um, Oakland, California, West Oakland. Um, so coming here, I wanted to create something where I would have a, working in an underserved uh, community health center, it's primarily Medicaid, you know, like people who just, you know, have can't pay, you know, for, for quality, the same quality that they should be getting. Um, and people, even the doctors in there get burnt out and, and it's a tough environment. So I wanted to create something where I could have the dialogue I wanted with my community, with the community I identified with, while at the same time it being, it, I have more control over who, who I'm having those conversations with. And I have control over who I say yes to and who I say no to. Um, so when I say just, I mean, it's, I, I just want it to be the basic, just medical care. Like I just want to provide, I don't want the, I don't want all the other stuff involved. I don't want the, um, I don't want to have to be assigned to a weekend shift where I don't, you know, where I'm doing something where I don't feel comfortable with or, uh, covering for someone. I don't, you know, I just wanted to be, I just wanted to provide the medical care, but then I also wanted it to be fair, like just like, like, right. Like, like sometimes, you know, I think as, as physicians, we value our time. Um, I mean, you're paying for our time, right? You're paying for our advice, our time. Obviously, a surgeon, you're paying for their technical expertise. But any doctor you go to, you're just paying, you know, the only reason, the only thing that makes them special is that they can write prescriptions. Um, but every, and otherwise, it's just information uh, and time. Um, so I, I wanted to use my time, you know, in a way that was not not based on, hey, I need to hit this quota by this this amount in this time. It's, I want to solve your problem in the best way that I can, given that, you know, I think at the early career, you kind of, I don't want to say you're chasing either a title or money or this or that. I think I'm in a state of my career where I'm like, I'm not chasing any titles or, or, or money or, or I'm just, I just want to be present in a community where you know, the need is there. So that's why that's just medical care. Like it's still in its infancy, but 
Um, I do want to, you know, I'm going to have other mental health providers. I want to bring in mental health because I just see that that's like a really big need um, and the access isn't there. Uh, I don't, I don't do mental health, but I can, you know, facilitate that. Um, and then just kind of grow from there. I think that the next step is mental health and then, you know, fitness. Um, I do do some, so what I do, so I like to, I focus on weight loss, weight loss and diabetes. And so I, funny thing is it's kind of, I got the idea just randomly. Like I was at a, I was doing, I was thinking about cosmetics, but, um, I do do lipo, liposuction. I have a machine that does like laser lipo. <laughs> And, uh, but the way I, I envisioned it was it's hard to get someone to lose weight over the long term. Like it's, it's, you know, they, they don't see, people don't see five pound weight loss, you know, like at a certain weight, it's like, oh, I lost five pounds. And that's a good thing. You know, it's not even about the weight loss. It's not, it's really about the better habits. It's like eating better and being more active whether you lose 20 pounds or eight pounds, it's, it's, it's a bit irrelevant if you're eating much better. Um, but people don't see it like that. They see, oh, I only lost eight pounds. That's a failure. Uh, I don't see my, you know, I don't see the, my abs. That's a failure. Uh, my arm's still flabby. So I do the lipo as a precursor, as a, as a people, people don't like to lose what they've gained. So if you can see, Hey, whoa, my, my stomach is a little, uh, you know, it's not perfect, but you know, I see some improvement. You're more likely to say, okay, well now how do we make sure you, you know, you don't go back and Hey, maybe you could even get some more progress. So I, I felt like lipo was a good way to, you know, to get into that and, and provide that service as well. And, and people, you know, love lipo, you know, they, they love the quick fix, but I, I think over the long term, I think, so that's part of the practice too. So I'm trying to get that messaging out. Like it's not a cosmetics med spa, but I do want to provide that service. I think that's great. Um, you know, I, 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 I'm on the other end of that spectrum when it comes to, to people trying to just better their lives and feel better when it comes to weight being an issue with joint pain and what have you. So we do talk about that a little bit. And I do think there's a mental health component to that that is not shared and not focused on enough and just our healthcare system, right? Because a lot of those things when it comes to eating habits and one's propensity to eat something as opposed to eat something bad or not the best for you as opposed to eating something that's good for you does come from, you know, how we feel, our emotions, our mental state, et cetera. Depression can definitely cause some of those things. And even like just education about what is or what are the best things to eat um, can also be a factor in addition to, you know, how you were raised. Um, I'm sure you've done studies and, and seeing many things on, you know, when it comes to food being in certain areas and, you know, the access that people have to certain foods in their area and that just dictating what people do eat and how that can lead to not just being overweight, but also diabetes, type 2 diabetes, or what have you. So all the things are connected. Um, and again, I'm on one side of that, but you being on the front end of that is, is amazing. And I have another friend who actually is in the uh, New York, New Jersey area, who does the same kind of thing that you're doing, um, based in, in New Jersey, um, which is great. And I think more of these places popping up is going to be ideal for people. My question for you now, Doc, is that, you know, I know that it's Black History Month and um, diabetes has been something that has plagued our, our people for years, right? It's something that um, when it comes to numbers, we are dying more uh, than most people are, right? In the U.S., Black adults are nearly twice as likely as white adults to develop type 2 diabetes, and this racial disparity or disparity has been rising over the last 30 years, right? What are your thoughts on how we can um, even try to reduce these things from increasing? Yes, coming to you is going to be beneficial, and I do think that will help them to make better steps towards living better, um, and I'm guessing how can we help to educate others so we can reduce these rates because they're still yeah. growing even in today's society. So and, and there's a, you know, a, you, you touched on so many components of, of diabetes and, and weight, um, you know, whether it be mental health, whether it be, you know, food deserts and access to, to quality food, um, whether it be, you know, access to healthcare and just screenings. I mean, just something as simple as screening is overlooked and, um, 
you know, there, that's why there's such a thing called pre-diabetes. You know, it's not quite diabetes, it's pre-diabetes because there's a, diabetes takes five, 10, you know, it depends on the person, but it takes years to develop, right? So if you know, if you, let's say, you know, you come in, you, you have a client that, you know, you know, African-American, let's say, that's, um, you know, that maybe they're 10 pounds overweight, 20 pounds overweight, you know, young, thir- mid thirties, and they don't go to the doctor. I don't, you don't see, you don't see us going to the doctor. Yeah. You know, and maybe cause healthcare is, is a quasi privilege, you know, it's, it's, we say it's not a privilege, but it, it, it is, you know, like good healthcare, quality healthcare is, is somewhat of a privilege. Um, you know, the, if your, your leg is falling off, you know, it's not, you know, it's, a uh, um, you get, you get healthcare, you get adequate, but if screenings is, is, you have to access it. You have to, you know, have health care, health insurance first. Then you have to have a doctor in your area. Then you have to have the time to get off. Then you have to, you know, your doctor can't take four hours to have you in the waiting room at a community health center. Like, it's just, there, there are things that there are barriers that people, even if it's not simply financial or enough doctors, there's, there's still barriers. So Screen, let's say your your A1C is is a little bit high in the in the you know the the test for diabetes is is in the pre-diabetes range. You have so much time, you have time to reverse it and not get diabetes, right? So all you had to do was know the knowledge of hey, I have pre-diabetes, I need to make these changes now, you know, because once you hit diabetes, then we're in a different, we're in a different ballgame. And especially if you come in, you know, to the emergency room with diabetic you know, ketoacidosis, then it's like, okay, now we're, you know, now you're on insulin. You're, you know, you go down a line where people don't want to take a a shot every day. People don't want to take a pill every day. People, you know, it's much easier to say, Hey, you have, you're slightly high. Why don't you stop drinking sugary drinks? You know, see how that works. Why don't you stop just a little thing, not, not something major. And I, I just don't feel like in, I, I see our community, I see the Black African-American community, let's say Black and Brown communities as like not having, you know, the, A, the, the resources such as, you know, you know, hospital, you know, the, the medical offices that aren't, that aren't just burnt out community health centers where all the doctors are, they're seeing 40 diabetic patients a day. And, you know, it's like, all right, uh, you know, we got five minutes, you know, what do you need? You know, um, that's why I want, that's why I say I want to have a dialogue with people and have the time and have my own flexibility to have that dialogue. Then you also have the, the, you know, if you look at the numbers, I mean, this is a, this is a fact that there are less black men in med school now or enroll in matriculating now, or let's say when they did the report a few years ago, than in 1970. So, you know, I tell a story where, you know, it, it's, you know, it's not, you know, it's not, um, there's no, it's no malice. There's no hatred. It's just, I understand that coming from my, com- the community, I came, I grew up in Brooklyn, Brown, I grew up in Brownsville. I grew up on uh, Rockaway and Atlantic. Um, so coming from that community, you know, then I moved to Jamaica, Queens, but coming from that community, I'm going to be able to talk to, talk to, uh, you know, someone, you know, from that community better. And the studies have proven that it's not even debatable. It's, it's if, you know, people from your own, you know, ethnicity will be more likely to listen to you. And in just even having that conversation when you're in the office, it's, it's less, it's more of a conversation and less of a, a hierarchy, you know, Hey, I'm better than you, or I'm the, I'm the guy you listen to. This is what you do. If you don't want to listen, then keep it moving. It's more of a, how can, how can, all right, I know you like this. I know, you know, you want to accomplish this in your life. How do we get you to accomplish that? Um, so I think having more uh, black doctors, you know, for lack of, you know, uh, that, I mean, it's not that easy, but, you know, it, t- it takes a long time to train a doctor, but lack of, you know, having that is a starting point. That's the ultimate starting point. I mean, that's what needs to happen. Now, what the levers we can change, obviously we want, we want to have better access to food. We want to have, want to do, you know, other things that, you know, a lot, the last thing I would say is there are a lot of new diabetes medications out that whether, you know, sometimes Medicaid doesn't have access to, sometimes it takes, you know, more effort to get those medications that, that are, I, you could just tell people in our community just don't have access to those medications. Like I'll, I'll get a patient where it's like, they're still on insulin from 20 years ago. 
and you know, like to another basic medication that you're like, wait, they're the, the medications now versus 20 years ago, it's like night and day. Like, why, why aren't you on this? Insulin makes you gain weight. There are medications out that make you lose weight. Why would you take a medication that makes you gain weight? So, you know, just the education around having quality physicians and then and then those physicians making that effort. I don't want to put it all on the doctors, nurse practitioners, the providers, but I think, you know, it's going to, it's going to take everyone. It's going to take, you know, the whole healthcare system, unfortunately, that is very difficult to change, but has to change in order for us to, in order for diabetes rates to significantly go down. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I hear what you're saying. I, I actually, um, my grandmother, uh, was diabetic. And I remember her taking medication and, um, you know, not knowing what was happening when I was younger, but recognizing as I got older, what was happening. Um, I was very grateful that she didn't have anything that was complicated in terms of losing limbs or what have you, but she was definitely on medication and definitely lived the life of being diabetic. And my dad was pre-diabetic for a minute and he changed his lifestyle ASAP. It was all just based on what he was eating. And actually in my book, I actually wrote about a chapter um, where I found out that I too was pre-diabetic for a minute. And that was surprising to me because as someone who was so active, uh, you know, going out, running, all these different things, for me, my knowledge was, well, if you're active, then you're fine because you're, you're, you're at least doing what you have to do to burn off whatever. But it was the, the nutrition port, portion of it that was throwing me off. Too many carbohydrates, um, too many... Uh, even my protein drinks and what have you that had a lot of sugary uh, things in them. And, you know, my, my lemonades and what have you also, those kind of things added up to a point where my doctor said, look, you're not bad, but you're definitely borderline. My A1 level was six. So he said, you're definitely on, on the cusp. So you don't need medication. You just have to go in there and just literally change the way you're, 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 you're eating and what you're doing and do more water and just change your diet. And I literally... After that day, stopped everything, and my numbers went down immediately from having a fatty liver and having um, the numbers that were spiking to just being back to a normal level, or no fatty liver again. And I was grateful that that interaction was literally with me just doing a, a physical. I was going there for um, uh, to to do something for my, my job, so I had like a chest X-ray, and as a result, they did blood work, and they found based on the blood work that my levels were high. I would have never known, but you know, you don't feel anything. You don't know anything. Everything feels fine. But like you said, if people aren't doing routine checkups, if they're not going to the doctor on a regular basis, doing blood work, et cetera, you may never know that your levels are higher until it's too late. And right. I think what you're saying is completely right. The education piece and having more uh, people who look like us in those environments to educate people who look like us. Um, education is, is, is the way to go. And I think what you're doing down there is, is going to be life-changing in the sense that, you know, a number of people, especially young people, when they see Black doctors, right, um, it's a game changer, even in 2022, right? Because you said there, the numbers of people who are in medical school who look like us are, are, are decreasing. The number of people who are out there practicing are not as high as they should be. So seeing someone like you uh, in that environment, that by itself can inspire someone to change their diet to change their habits to change their lifestyle just recognizing that you know where they've been from you know how to talk to someone who's been in a certain area and you can reach someone that someone else probably can't that's um that's that's an important point that you made and and that you, you, we kind of that we need to i think the number i i saw was there you know the like the Amer usa is a uh, 13 percent black ish and there are, I think, 4% Black doctors in the country. And you know a lot of that because, you know, it's unfortunate, but there's a, there is the idea of Black exceptionalism, right? So if you make it, you're like the head surgeon of Stanford, you know, like you're like, you either you make it that big or you're kind of like, you don't make it, you know, and it's, it's, um, it's a, there's a bottleneck. There's, there's a, there's something, there's a glass ceiling that if you can break through, you break through. But if you can't, there's just so many barriers along the way. Um, a book I want you, a book that was really good, that that was very educational, I think, and it's easy to read, The Obesity Code um, by, I believe his last name is Fung, but his it's it really breaks down the root causes of obesity and diabetes, like in a, in a just an easy to, 
dig digestible way. Um, and I think that even as a physician, that helped my understanding, but I think it would help the a lay person's understanding. So if I could tell your viewers a good book to read, Obesity Code or Diabetes Code, they're kind of intertwined. That's great. That's great. Doc, another question for you. I know that weight management is somewhat psychological, but also somewhat physical. Um, what's what's the, the, the ratio you think in terms of if someone is trying to go out there, say they come and see you, right? And, and they have a, a weight issue. Um, you know, how much of what they're going to be learning from you is going to be what they have to do on the physical realm and how much of it is going to be, like you said, you're talking about bringing in mental health at some point in time for your practice. How much of it is also going to be the mental capacity or the mental um, challenges that they have to go through to, to get their weight down as well? Well, there's so much undiagnosed depression, anxiety in, our, in every community. I don't even want to break it down to our community. Um, you know, and there's just People just don't, I mean, I think people are doing a better job of recognizing it now. I think it's it's more socially acceptable to, to say that in public and recognize it. But um, you know, there's there's um it's it's still a it's still a thing. And people treat their depression in different ways. And eating is is one manifestation of, of depression. Eating and sleeping, you know, not being active, withdrawing socially. That's that's one manifestation of, of depression, one of many. That, so there's always gonna there there is a mental health component um, to to weight loss um, because you found let's say let's say you you brought up your example you found out pre diabetic you had to make X Y Z changes you you took the steps I mean you're a motivated person I know you you're you know you. I'm surprised. I'm even when I heard that story, I was surprised. I'm like, you were a super athlete. That that triple jump, you were <laughs> you were no joke on the triple jump. Uh, but um, you know, there's but you took the initiative, and you know, I you know, I don't know your mental health condition, but you know, like you, it, there was no, I'm sure there was difficulty, but there were you 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 overcame all the barriers that 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 were required. Some people can't. You know, some people just, you know, you tell them, hey, just don't don't drink, you know, those sugary drinks. Don't drink Coca-Cola. Start there, you know, control your portions. And it's easier said than done. Um, so I think having that, I think motivation is obviously mental, right? The, the, the motivation is not. Uh, it's not just it's not just laziness, you know, not some people. Maybe you could consider that. But for the most part, there's there's that drive to be healthy. And, and, you know, I think that's, that's a self-reflection of, Hey, I don't want the problems down the line, but I also have an ideal version of myself that I need to, I need to achieve because it's at jeopardy right now. It's, it's, you know, if I, you know, there's, there's a certain weight where your, your body can't, your body can't kind of manage, you know, your, your, you know, whether it be cholesterol, whether it be blood sugar, whether it be, you know, just, 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 you know, day-to-day -day life, um, your, your body d does tell you, you know, and I think when you're getting those signals and you're still, you know, not able to, to make lifestyle changes, you know, you're not gonna, and that, and that's why I say it's, it's connecting with people, right? It's not just me telling you, Hey, this medication will help you lose weight. Like if it were that easy, I would just prescribe that medication and you would lose weight. You know, it's not, it's not just a medi, hey, do this medication. And it's not just don't eat this food and you'll lose weight. It's how do you feel about yourself? And how, how can I help you reach your, your ideal version of yourself? Um, so you live the longest, you know, and the healthiest that you can live. Um, I think if you start from that starting point, then you have so much, um, you know, then it's not about a number. It's not about, Hey, I was 300 pounds and I'm 250. So all, all is good in the world. It's, you know, I was, you know, I was not eating well and I didn't feel good about myself because of these factors. And my, my whole, my, I was treated holistically and my whole self was treated. Part of that was the increased calories in my diet. Part of that was my inactivity. Part of that was, you know, how I felt about myself, you know, my mental health and, somebody or, or a group of people or people identified people were able to help me identify think smaller things to change that I that were manageable and and hopefully you, you you get to a certain point so the final weight doesn't 
to me, doesn't really, you know, I, I can't control what the final weight will be, but I can see you at a follow-up visit and say, hey, you know, you hopefully you've lost weight, uh, but if you haven't lost weight, okay, what, what else is there? What else can we, can we find? You know, cause there, there must be something there. Cause so the way I see it, it's, it's, you know, there, your body and the, you know, obviously books and studies have shown, you know, your body needs a certain amount of calories and you're, you're really not going to lose weight if you eat 3000 calories a day. Right. So if you're not, eat, if you're eating 3000 calories a day, that's the, that's the first thing we need to address in weight loss. Um, but if you're saying you're telling me you're, you're eating 1500 calories a day and haven't lost a pound, I mean, it's either something, you know, do we need to do some more studies and, and see if there's a, you know, pituitary issue, you know, like where, where are we going with this? You know, like where, or are you not counting calories? Maybe, Hey, maybe you're saying those cookies don't count in my, my 1500 calories and, and those, you know, X, Y, you know, whatever doesn't count. Right. So maybe you're not seeing things the right way. So obviously there's mental, I think it's a long way to say there's a mental health component. There's a, there's an education component. There's, you know, there's a, many components that you can't really, it's, it's hard to, unless you hear, speak to someone, you can't really identify. And I think the, you know, then the, the cultural aspect, you know, is also a component. So I hope to, you know, be able to identify. And I think I've, I've when you start your career, when you when you start in or training in medicine, you're, you're you're starting now. I think you you have that fear. You, you know it deep down, but you have that fear. But I, you know, I finished residency about five years ago, and I think you know I'm kind of past that that fear of, you know, hey, am I gonna am I gonna do well enough for my you know for my patients? You know, I I think I'm past that. So you know, it's time to you know, we about to be 40 this year. So you know, I think it's I think it's our time. You know, I think it's our time to to show the world that, you know, we, we've been students for so long, we've been, you know, waiting in the wing for so long. So why not, why not now? Absolutely, absolutely. I have a question for you. I, you know, I, a number of people talk about wanting to lose weight and I think it's, it's a pretty, um, it's a very specific uh, request or I guess goal for many people. Some people are clearly, when we talk about BMI, right? BMI is pretty much our, our, our general standard for right. whether someone needs to lose weight or not. And some people um, may fall in that, in that realm of being overweight or obese based on that, that principle. Um, but most people, whether they do or not, I think everyone likes to tighten up and lose weight in general, right? Um, when it comes to liposuction though, uh, a number of people, uh, have asked me, and this again is not in my realm of practice, but they've asked me, you know, should they get liposuction? Is it something that they should consider? Is it something that they should be doing? And my my usual response is, well, you know, have you tried the other things first in terms of, like you talk, mentioned, exercise and dieting and counting your calories and you know, checking your mental health status and all those different things. But I guess my question for you is who actually is an ideal candidate for liposuction when it comes to liposuction as, well, we're going to do this now, you know, cause there are some people who may say, look, I don't want to work out. Just give me the liposuction. Let's get this over with. Right. right. Um, so I'm always curious who is, and, and then clearly there are people who are ideal candidates cause it's hard for them to lose weight in general. So who in your, in expert opinion are those candidates who are, are ideal for uh, surgeries like liposuction? Yeah. So my, what I do, I'm minimally invasive. So basically I have a, I have a laser that melts the fat. So it's actually very minimally invasive. Um, it's so don't, don't, but what I do is I wouldn't call, call it surgery. Um, but you know, so, so liposuction there, like, like you're kind of getting at, there are levels, um, for what I do, let's, let's say, um, and then we can kind of expand, but it's mainly for, I would say someone with, once you, once again, it kind of goes back to the mental, mental health component, but also with areas, you know, uh, like I wouldn't recommend someone who's, you know, with a BMI of 40, 45, morbidly obese to get liposuction. I mean, it's, it's going to be pointless. Um, you're, you're not going to get an ideal outcome. You're not going to, you'll never slim down to what you feel like you, you want to be. Um, you know, it's, it's, Little pricey. I mean, pricey enough. You know, it's your money, um, and it's 
it's not a weight loss treatment. And so that's rule number one. It's not, this is not done for weight loss. You're not even, you probably won't even lose weight, you know, maybe two, three, five pounds, you know? So it's not a weight loss treatment. Um, so I think anyone who can, that's a starting point. Like you, you need to understand that first. Um, so I think someone with like a BMI of 35 to 40, you know, it's okay. As long as there's, if, if their complaint is, you know what, my, you know, my flanks, you know, um, I, I don't love my love handles. And, you know, I, I really would feel better about myself if, you know, I, I didn't have these love handles or I didn't have the bra roll or I didn't have the, you know, the, the belly sticking out. Like if, it, if there's a specific part of your body that, you know, you want to have addressed because then once that is addressed, cause that, A, that's more achievable. And B, once you do get that, once again, you're not going to want to lose. You're not going to want to revert back to, cause obviously that was on your mind enough to, to want to spend the money to, to take the initiative to do it. And then B, I mean, there's also, you know, like, like when I say med, med spas, you know, there's nothing wrong with med spa, you know, that's a need for that. Right. But I'm a primary care doc, you know, who can, who is trained to, to do these procedures. So I'm going to see it as, okay, well, I do blood work to, to even get the, the lipo, I, you got to do a whole thing of blood work, right? So I'm going to know if you're diabetic. So if I see you're diabetic, I might not even do the, if it's that bad, I'm not going to do it. Um, but then I'm also going to say, all right, you have to come back in order for me to do this. You have to come back, you know, you have to come up one more time before and then back in two months. So there's already that seed of like, okay, well, we, we accomplished this. Now let's, let's get to the, let's get to the good stuff. You know, let's get to the important stuff, the stuff that'll make you have a healthier, longer life. So it's, so when it's ideal, it depends on the provider on, on what's ideal, because if a lot of, there may be places where they're just like, Hey, get them in, get them out. Okay. I I don't want to, I'll never follow up with you again. Um, That doesn't long-term, that's not going to of dress weight loss or, or, or diabetes or anything, but having someone who's still engaged or, or at least even reaching out to your primary doc would actually go a long way to, I think just mentally say, Hey, I think that's my biggest, uh, my biggest selling point or, or the biggest thing that I think it captures people. It's like, and I also actually, um, set people up with a personal trainer. I work with closely with a personal trainer and say, Hey, you have to, you may not, you don't have to stay with them, but you have to, prior to the procedure, you know, I want you to have an appointment with them and he's going to give you some advice on meal prep for the week, you know, for the weeks prior and the weeks after the immediate procedure. So meal prep and, and exercises you can do, because, you know, you kind of, you can't do too much right after life, but it is, a, it is a painful process. So you kind of want the, you want to heal, but you can do some exercises. So just getting, just getting the ball rolling. I think it's a, you know, weight loss is, is so complicated. But the main thing is the lipo is not a weight loss procedure. Do not think that you're going to get any, any weight loss benefit long term. There's no magic bullet. I mean, it's weight, weight loss is, you know, very much based on our diet, our culture, our habits, our state of mind. Uh, you know, so I think it's a, you know, it's a fallacy to for someone to, to not want to to think that they could not exercise their way into weight loss, you know, and not, not eat their way into weight loss, you know, or change their diet, their way into weight loss. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I, I appreciate you saying that it's not the no magic bullet. I think a lot of people get lost in that, uh, especially with what we see on TV and commercials. And, you know, there are a thousand gimmicks people see about losing weight and what have you, which are, are never really accurate, but hearing it from you and recognize that even if you do do something like liposuction or what have you, for that procedure, there's still a process of doing some training. There's still a process of making sure you eat right. And there's still a process of you possibly maybe losing weight or, or not, but it's, it's a process you still have to go through to continue to get to where you want to be. And I think people lose, they do lose sight of that. So thank you for sharing. Yeah. I appreciate that. And if you can tell your, um, your viewers, or if I can tell your viewers that fasting is a, is a remarkable way to go. Um, even if you did, if you just fasted, if, if weight is your concern, if you fasted, and even if it wasn't your concern, but a healthy diet, two days a week, you know, three, every intermittent fasting, you know, uh, just don't, you know, eat, if you eat at six in the morning, don't eat until nine at night, you know, and, you know, you can try broth, you can, you know, you can drink water, 
but just no calories all day. You think your body, your body is, is telling you, oh, I'm hungry. You got to eat, got to eat. But you don't, you actually don't have to eat. You know, you, you, it's, it's, it's a completely mental thing that, to, that hunger is mental. It's not, it's not physical. It's not your stomach actually saying, hey, we're hungry. Come feed me. It's, it's your brain telling your stomach, it's about time to eat. You know, so if you can break that cycle of every three hours I got to eat or every eight hours I got to eat, um, you, your so just by, just by default, your calories are going to go down. I mean, if you don't eat for 15 hours a day, you're, you're going to eat less calories in a week if you do it three days a week. So, I mean, just sheer calories, you're going to go down, but then also your body starts breaking down the, 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 the sugar in your liver, the fat in your liver. So your fatty liver plummets your, I mean, even just the intermittent, just that time frame where you're breaking it down, just allowing your body that time to rest and break down the sugar and the fat in your, in your organs um, and in your peripheral, you, it's, and it's, it's doable. I mean, it's hard the first couple of weeks, but once you get in that habit, you're going to, it's, it's something where you'll see a noticeable difference. That's the one, that's the one, you know, there's, there's no magic bullet, but if you can keep that habit, if weight loss is your concern, I'm not saying everyone should do it. Um, then that's, what's going to give you the longest term result. Yeah, it's, I'm great. You, I'm glad you mentioned that. Actually, in my book, we talked about intermittent fasting. And my friend, who is also basically the you in New Jersey, wrote the chapter on that. And yeah, that's exactly what I did when I saw that my levels were going up. I started doing that. Um, you know, the eight hours uh, eating and 16 hours not. And I did 12 to eight, and it changed. It changed everything. Not just from my levels decreasing, but also just in terms of how I looked. Um, I was already working out and doing certain things, but then when I started doing that, it just made what I was doing even easier. And yeah, I agree with you so much of that. It really is mental. Once you get into a rhythm of doing that consistently, uh, you actually feel your body saying, I'm kind of hungry, but no, I'm not. I have enough things I can feed off of for a little bit until, you know, it really is time to eat. And you get into a habit, you can maintain that. It's, it's, it's great. So I'm glad you brought that up. I appreciate that. Um, Dr. B, listen, what, what insurances do you guys take at? Just medical care, just so the listeners who may be in Florida uh, can know. Oh, I'm working on um, multiple insurances right now, but right now, definitely take, I take Oscar, Florida Blue, Cigna, uh, working on Humana, that'll be soon. Um, Medicare, Medicaid, certain plans and Medicare, Medicaid. Um, and there's one other, oh, and Aetna. So I try to take it all and then cash you know, I can work with you with, with, per visit. Um, obviously the uh, lipos cash, um, but try to, I'm trying to take them all. I'm trying to take all the major players in the area. Um, if there's one that I'm not, I haven't been exposed to, I'll, I'll definitely consider I'll apply, but you know, it takes like six months. Uh, but yeah, just any, and then, you know, if, if it's, if it's something where not that I'm not doing things for free, but if it's, if you need, a, you know, a quick console or, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to get gouge people or, or, or do anything, you know, just for um, financial gain. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like that. And I think that you uh, giving all of these spectrum to people to come and see you is, is the best way to do it. I love that you're still committed to serving all the areas, especially the areas where people might not have access to um, not just your services, but just you as a person. Um, and I do want to just, as we conclude, just recognize that, you know, I think that the entire process, right, from Prep 9 to Choke to UPenn and everywhere else you've been, it's been awesome seeing your progression, Bami. Like, um, it's it's amazing that we're even here. You know, I'm not going to lie to you. Like, like Everyone who I've seen from, um, from Choke moving forward has been doing great things. And the fact that you are out here literally changing people's lives, um, around the world. It's just, I'm honored to see it. I'm honored to see you uh, doing your thing. And Just Medical Care is going to be a great asset to Tampa, Florida. So I appreciate you. Anything else you want to share with the listeners about Just Medical Care or about you or how they can follow you on social media or otherwise? Yeah, I'm on, um, I'm trying to figure out my, uh, my social media strategy. And, and you know, this is, a, this is a single person operation right now, or, you know, I have one employee. So uh, any advice would be uh, appreciated, but I'm on uh, 
Just Medical Care at um, on Yahoo. I'm sorry, Yahoo <laughs> on Instagram uh, and Facebook. I can um, let's see. I also have my website www.justmedicalcare.com uh, with all the links um, and you know just any information that you need should be on the website. And I I will try to post more and just kind of give more information about what what we're doing. We have a if anybody's in the Tampa area on the 26th of February, there's going to be I'm having an event for the community, you know, just to kind of just to show people I'm here. We're going to give uh, gift bags of food. We're going to have uh, or gift bags and then food bags. Um, it'll be at my office. Uh, if you're in the area, 10, 10, 10320 North 56th Street in Temple Terrace. Um, Anybody's welcome in the community. Um, all I ask is that you, you know, you talk to me for, you know, to get to know me or, or say hi. Um, and that's all. You're welcome. Awesome. Dr. Bami, thank you so much for being on the episode uh, for this show. You've made 87 one for the books. I appreciate you so much. And uh, I look forward to uh, either coming down there to see you down there or if you're ever back in the Brooklyn area, come holler at me and uh, we'll play some basketball or something. We'll get it up. You still hoop? All right. I'll come back to you just for that. <laughs> Pleasure talking to you, Sean. You too, Dr. Mommy. And folks, don't forget the quote from today. Doing the best at this moment puts you in the best place for the next moment. There are so many things that Dr. Mommy talked about in terms of your health, uh, ways you can, if you are in that boat, right? You're talking about weight loss. You're talking about the mental state you need. You're talking about... Um, just eating healthier, right? Drinking more water, intermittent fasting, all things we talked about on this show. is just being reinforced now by other people. We did not talk about this before the show. Everything he talked about was from his perspective for his practice, but there are things that, as you see, they do work. So uh, follow Dr. Bami and his new practice and his, and his platform. Continue to uh, reach out if you are in the Tampa area. And if you are not, and you're still just doing your thing around here, Continue to take these nuggets and improve your life any way that you can. For all the things, again, our website, bemoresay.com, for my book, uh, our swag store is open and doing its thing. And of course, the podcast heard everywhere on Apple and your favorite podcast platforms. If you have any questions or want to reach out to Dr. Bami directly, you can email me at drshawn at bemoresay.com and I'll link you guys up together to see what's going on so you too can be the best version of you. And folks, as I always say, have a good day. Have a good night, have a great life, and continue to take your steps greatness to be the best version of you. Happy Black History Month. I'll see you next week. Peace.